second special event this evening is that we have some special guests. I would like to acknowledge the president of the Boer Corporation and his wife, John Fisher, and his wife, Janice, and I'd like to stand them up, ask them to stand up and welcome them. This leads me to the third special event. The third special event deals with our speaker this evening. I've been around here for a number of years, and I could say flat outright I've never had the pleasure and the joy of introducing someone to speak here in the hundreds of people that we've had and the dozens of people that I've introduced that I have tonight. The Chinese, as you all know, have for centuries, for thousands of years, been able to develop with the greatest skill and subtlety the relationship between architecture and the environment, between the forces of man and his goals and aspirations and the forces and beauty of nature. They have contributed significantly to architecture, to planning, to landscape architecture, to the design in all fields, to structure, and these contributions have been lasting, enduring, and um, most influential. We have the privilege tonight of having with us one of the foremost architects in the world, the chief architect of the Peking Institute for Architectural Design, the designer of the state guest house in which the past four presidents of the United States have resided, uh, as well as a number of other foreign dignitaries, uh, the designer of the planetarium, the, one of the largest museums in the world, the National Museum, which depicts the entire history of China on Tiananmen Square. He has 1,500 people that are working now for him, and they're probably goofing off a little because he's here. <laughs> It is absolutely a joy to be able to introduce to you tonight our speaker, Chiang Kai-Chi. But wait, I would like to now dispense with the formal portion of my introduction and get a little bit more personal. This isn't going to be a brief introduction. It only has a couple of minutes. Please bear with me. I was at the local grocery store several years ago looking at magazines which I occasionally do, respectable magazines. <laughs> and I was reading House and Garden, because on the cover it said that there was a huge article about China, and I was planning to take a group of architecture students from this university to China, and I figured here was a chance for me to find out a little bit more about China. And the, there was a picture of a man on the first page of the most important article, and there was our speaker's picture. And so I figured, here's a chance for me to make a contact in China. Maybe I'll never hear from him, but I wrote him a letter. And to my surprise, four weeks later, I got a personal reply. And we were continuing this um, uh, correspondence for over a year before we actually made our trip. I realized that I was getting quite a bit of help from this man, but I didn't realize uh, who I was really dealing with until I got to China and I found out that he allowed us to go into the Great Hall of the People, into the Emperor's private quarters, and he took us on tours through the uh, Temple of Heaven, and he came to the hotel to lecture to the students, and he telephoned around the country and had people in architecture schools waiting for us. And I started to realize that at that point I was not dealing with the average architect, um, something for which I've been eternally grateful. Our trip was a huge success thanks to the efforts of this man. Um, I never dreamed that within four years we would have the opportunity to have him here in his first trip to the United States, and this dream has come true because I'm really happy to say that he's here. Not only is he here, but his wife is here, and his son is here, and for his son, this is nothing new because he's back to Ball State having received a degree from us a year before, and then he went out to Berkeley and finished a two-year master's program in one year, and he's trying to credit Ball State with his success, but I'm trying to credit his dad for 
give him what he needed before he even left town. Um, that was the informal part of the introduction. Now I have a part that's even less formal than the informal part. We had the good fortune of uh, being up in South Bend a few days ago for the Indiana Society of Architects Convention, and um, Chiang Kai-chi was the guest of honor, and um, some people from the other university know their name, thank you. <laughs> Thought they were being smart by presenting him a hat that said, um, um, Notre Dame, the, um, the fighting Irish. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot what that said. He put that on. I told him it would be difficult to wear it here. You notice he's not wearing it. I went to the bookstore and we bought. He now has, he doesn't have it here because he was out to dinner and he wanted to look respectable, but he has a hat now that does indeed say Ball State. For his son, he picked out a hat that was Charlie Cardinal, which was an actual physical depiction of the Cardinal's head on top of the hat, and he wore it all afternoon. The, um, the president of Ball State University and uh, some of the vice presidents learned of this, and they were a little upset that the other university was trying to more or less um, win his favor with these hats that they merely bought from their local bookstore. So they asked me if you could just hold this microphone to present uh, Dr. Chiang Kai-chi with this beautiful Ball State University shirt, <laughs> which if you could see from the back, <laughs> this, I now took the speaker's notes and took them out of order completely because they dropped on the floor. I waited all this time to make the most important introduction. His speech will now be backwards. But fortunately for us, it'll be in English. And without further ado, I would like to say on behalf of Ball State University and the architects from Indiana, and for all the help you've given us in China and continue to give us, we are most grateful and we are most happy to celebrate National Day with you. And we are happy to have your lovely wife and your son who was no trouble at all during the time he was here. It's, a, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have with us this evening the foremost architect in the People's Republic of China, Chiang Kai-chi. As an architect, I'm more used to making sketches than making speeches. But tonight, I will try my best. And I will speak about the rural housing in China. As you all know, China is a very big country. It has a territory of 9.6 million square kilometers of land, which is slightly larger even than the United States and uh, of which 90% is rural. China also has a population of about 1 billion people, of which 80,000 million people live in the rural area. So to a great extent, the image of rural China reflects the image of China and if one has been only to the cities of China, but not to the rural area and the small towns, it is impossible for them to see China as a whole, nor the real China. And ever since uh, year 1978, 
Chinese, the Chinese government has introduced many reforms. And the, the key agricultural change is the introduction of the contract system with the families becoming responsible for the cultivation of specified crops or for raising animals. Thus, uh, the Chinese peasants has been getting much better off day by day. And the, the first thing, the now more well to do Chinese peasants likes to do is to build houses for themselves. So let's see some table. As, as you can see from the table, the Chinese peasants, the annual net income of the Chinese peasants is increasing significantly in recent years. And so is the, their annual savings. And so is the building expense in their annual net income. The percentage of uh, building expense in their uh, annual net income. So uh, this will serve to, to show that the Chinese peasants now not only can make a decent living, but also can put aside some money to build houses. And then there are now another table. And from this table, we can see, you see, uh, in, a, in a period from 1957 uh, to 1978, a period of 20 years, the rural China has built about 2.3 million square, square feet of uh, houses. But in a short time of four years, that is from year 1978 to year 1982, China has built 2.3 uh, billion square meters of rural houses. The same, same amount. So what the rural China has built in the past four years is equal to the what China has built in past 20 years. Now, China is also a nation with a long history. Uh, the king dwellings in house, a house in China, have a, a, a history of at least 4,000 years, while the courtyard houses in China can date back at least 2,000 years ago. At the same time, the China has vast territories which covers from the very cold northwest to the tropical east, tropical, tropical south. China is also a country of many nationalities, which includes Han, like me, and uh, the Mongolia, the Manchuria, the Tibetan, and the Chinese Muslim, and also many minority groups, which totals about 50 in number and uh, spread all over the various parts of China. So because of the difference of climate and natural environment, environment in different regions, and the different habits and ways of life of different nationalities, the architectural heritage in China is very rich and very diversified. But it is a pity in the past but when it comes to the to speaking of the traditional Chinese architecture, people used to think only the palaces in Peking, the gardens in Sochu, or maybe the temples in some uh, scenic places. But very few people know, the, know 
knows that exists in the rural China a rich heritage of Chinese architecture. The, and this rural Chinese architecture, I think, is not useful in for designing modern rural house, but it also will provide inspirations for the Chinese architects to create a new Chinese style in architecture. So let us rediscover China, the rural China. In the various regions of rural China, there have been many types of dwelling houses. In the north, high plateaus, northwest high plateaus of China, Oh, this is a, yes, uh, before I, uh, I uh, let me first show you some of the new houses, rural houses built in the recent years. We are part of China. These houses are designed and built by the peasants themselves. So I think this is the architecture without the architects. So <laughs> These are some houses for the new rich peasants. So it's too much westernized is to be inside. No, let us, let me see. Uh, speak about the various types of Chinese dwelling house in the high plateaus of northwestern China. About. Four million people still live in kept dwellings. Kept dwellings, dwellings. These are kept dwellings in the northwest part of China. And in, in the plains of Mongolia, the nomadic tribes used to live in a round shaped tent, which is called a yurt. Actually, it's not a mobile house. Okay. But these yurts are beginning to dis uh, disappear, as most of the uh, present herdsmen tend to settle down in one place instead of roaming from one place to another. And in the southern part of southeastern part of China, where the climate is very hot and the humidity is very high, and uh, in order to have better ventilation and uh, uh, low humidity, people used to live in, a, in houses with their with their uh, floors raised high above the ground. The entire houses rest on stairs. Which, which I think might remind of the several houses, uh, Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier. Uh, Right. However, in many parts of China, the majority of people live in a courtyard house. The size of this courtyard varies from region to region. In the cold regions, courtyards are usually larger in size in order to invite more sunshine. In the, while in the tropical or semi-tropical regions, courtyards are smaller in size just to keep out the sunshine. And of course, the size and the number of courtyards also varies with the size of the house. A small house usually have only, has only one small courtyard, while a large house may have several large courtyards. 
see some see some rise of this courtyard house. This is a very small courtyard house. Only one courtyard, okay? With house on three sides of the yard. Yeah. And this is also a very small courtyard house. Also, a small courtyard. You see, this the courtyard here is very small because this, this house is located in the southern part of China. Different varieties of courtyards. This is a series of courtyard houses, from the basic one courtyard to the not, uh, to later to five courtyards. <laughs> this is a courtyard house for a landlord. So you see, we, we have very stark walls on all four sides, and looks. And also have a watch tower just for defense. This is the larger courtyard house. So there are two courtyards. This is a very big courtyard. So you just call yourself, all the main courtyards are there. <laughs> And the exterior walls of this courtyard house are usually without any windows. This is for this is for privacy as well as for security. And in some courtyard, uh, in some coastal regions in China, like Fujian. Canton, where in the past the, the pirates from the sea often frequent, frequent. The exterior wall of the house are made so so thick and so solid that some of the houses of the landlord look just like fortresses and even have a, a watchtower. You see, oh, I'm sorry, but this is too much. Oh, that's right. This is some interior of the courtyard house. Yes, you see this house looks, they have practically no, no windows in, in its exterior wall. And this wall is so thick and so solid as you can see from the rear of the entrance. Yes. So more or less, this is a sort of fortress. You see, and you see the watchtower, in which the owner of the house can look out and uh, take necessary defensive measures when necessary. But defensive measures when necessary. The rural house in China are mostly one story high, but in South and Southern China regions, houses are usually two story high. And in some regions, the minority groups, uh, of the minority groups, a few large rural houses are even as high as four stories. You see, this, this house is a rock composed of two circles. The off circle is four story high, while the inner circle is two story high. This house has at least more than one uh, hundred rooms and is shared by many families. I think this house was built at least 200 years ago, and I think this might be the first apartment house in the world. This is 
square one, uh, other uh, is the wrong one. This is very pretty curious. Each each family is to share one bay of the the the, 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 the house. Uh, the traditional Chinese house are usually of wood frame construction, and so all the interior walls, walls are non bearing walls, and inside the house only wooden partitions are used, which makes the interior of the Chinese rural house very flexible. You see, the Chinese house are usually of wooden construction. You see. All wood. <laughs> you see, the building materials of the Chinese rural house also varies greatly in different regions. Generally, only local materials is used. So in some regions where wood is abandoned, houses are built of entirely of wood. For instance, in some other regions, uh, like the mountain, uh, mountain sides, this is the you see, this happens to be a, 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 a part of the building is now demolished. So you, the architect can see here the uh, a rear section of the house. All these houses are of wooden construction. And in, in some places, houses are built of stone. And they have different bonds of stone, you see. This is, and this is a mixture of stone and uh, brick. This house is of brick. And these house are of no mm, law us. The law us houses are built by two methods. One method is to build houses with precast law us bricks. The, and the, the other method is to build inside with wooden frames. These law us walls are about uh, 60 to 7 millimeters, thick, millimeters in thickness. It's not only good for insulation, but also good for defense. And sometimes the raw earth wall can also be used to repair roads. So the raw earth is a very ideal building materials for the Chinese rural house. Uh, you see, all these houses, uh, this house is made of pre-cast lovers, bricks, focus. <laughs> you see, this house, it has practically no windows. And it's, it's built on the poster to be. And this is uh, uh, was are made outside by Paul. Inside of uh, this drawers combined with wooden structure. And this is drawers combined with stone. 
And this house is a, a combination of, of wood and uh, uh, wood and uh, clay and the lower. I think it's, uh, it looks some, uh, quite like the English half timber house, uh, just like the house of Mr. Ball. <laughs> And in the traditional Chinese houses, pitch loaf with loafing tires were extensively used. There are many types of pitch loaves, and the most commonly used one is the gable loaf, while hip loaf and uh, the combination combination of hip loaves and uh, uh, gable loaves are also used. And uh, in some regions, the, uh, like the Fujian province, the hip loaf is very popular. And these hip loaves uh, have very, these are gable loaves. Gable now this is a combination of gable rope and the hip rope. This is also a combination. This is the a hip roof with very uh, small slope. I, and I think these houses are more or less like, uh, more or less like the houses uh, in Spain or Italy. The treatment of uh, the loaf ridges also varies from region to region. Some is straight and some is curved. This is this rib is very much curved, just like a ball. And some simple and some is very elaborate, very ornate. And the gable walls have numerous forms. This is a simple gable wall, but from most of the gable wall, this is a very simple uh, gable wall. You see, these gables are a step. You see, here you can see all sorts of gable wall. The curved one, the step one, and the uh, uh, the more simple lean to is not an cable. And this is half curve, the half step. I take picture of the of the car in order to show the scale of the building. You see, this is a very uh, extraordinary type of treatment of gable wall. You see, there is a in uh, on, on the off sides of the gable. This is very rare. Usually, uh, you see, you cannot, you can see the detail. This is some detail of the cable wall. You see how graceful is that the curve of the, this great cable wall. This is some uh, detail of the cable wall. Very ornamental, you see. 
This is uh, 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 some detail of uh, the showing the treatment of a, a simple gable wall. And the wall is made of uh, roofing tiles laid vertically. And uh, the following, in the following slides, I will speak about the decoration of Chinese rural house. The wooden structure parts in the traditional Chinese houses are often decorated with some very simple carvings, as you can see in this slide, and are often without any painting. No painting on this wall. Uh, Works. And all the windows have very fine, uh, have grills of very elaborate design, as you can see from the following slide. This is the design of a, a panel in, uh, in a door, in a wooden door, above is the grill. And this is the key for a, a, a doorway. Oh, I'm sorry, this, this picture is, uh, should be vertical instead of horizontal. So you can uh, see from the this is to some ornamental treatment of the gable wall. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. All the picture are in the wrong direction. Maybe you have to adjust your head to the picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to stand upside down now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ah, uh, I'm sorry. You see, uh, this is uh, some sort of uh, relief made of clay and color, which can be only found in the southern part of China. Here are the details. This is uh, a, a gateway entrance for us. This building is not too old. I think it's about less than 100 years old. And this uh, is a, uh, a, 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 a house which has when they very fine carving, as you can see from the detail, you see, this is, this is the carving. Even the Chinese painting is carved, not painted. Carved on the stone. You know, just look at these stone grooves. You, and you will find all kinds of animals on this grill, if, if you look uh, more clearly. And uh, of course, the entrance of the house is usually decorated uh, with a beautiful eve. And this is not a real a gateway, but it is uh, a replica, it is full-size model of a typical Chinese house gateway. And this is in, this model was in the center Pompidou, uh, some three, 
uh, ago during the uh, ex exhibition, which is called the Everyday Environment of China in uh, of China. And you, if you, you can see, there's a spread towards the environment for the deal on scene. And this is a typical Chinese uh, uh, doorway, the entrance. Do you find this, the small hole in the uh, right hand of the, the doorway? This is a special entrance provided for the house dogs. It's just large enough for the dogs, but not large enough for the burgers. So well, here are some examples of doorways of Chinese rural holiday. Chinese doorways are always uh, decorated with uh, uh, horizontal and vertical scores in red paper on, on their door frames. And also two pictures of the garden gods on the doors. Uh, so they actually form part and um, part of the decoration of the door. So these decorations are put on every year, uh, put on to replace old ones at the end of the, every year. And I think they add much, add much to the color and the life of the Chinese rural house. You see? And, uh, and the, the building of a new house uh, is always an occasion worth of celebration. But instead of color names, color name ceremonies, uh, as in the Western world, uh, in China, The owner of a new house often chose a lucky, the luckiest day uh, to celebrate the occasion when the houses are nearing completion. And uh, on that day, many guests are invited to watch the main rafter. You see, the that is the highest roster being placed in position amidst, amidst the noise of plenty of fire cutters. All these red schools are written the words of uh, uh, which expresses the good wishes of the house, house owner. <laughs> Red is the favorite color of the Chinese people because they think uh, the red color will bring them good luck. So red color is extensively used in many happy occasions like the uh, building new houses and the uh, weddings and the birthdays. This is the wedding hall. And you find you can find a baby is sleeping in this red bed. This is a, a Chinese dresser, a wardrobe. I don't know what it exactly is. And this is a Chinese kitchen. And this stove is designed and decorated by the peasants themselves. And I think this is interior decoration without interior decorator. And I wish this slice in red will bring you good luck too. Now, although the 
uh, the architecture of rural China is so rich and so colorful, so diverse, diversified. And also, uh, the rural China, in rural China, a building boom, a building boom has just started. But the picture of rural housing in China is not all that rosy and are not without any problems. And first, oh, oh, before this, I, I want to show you some rural scenes in, in, in China. And most of them of the sites were, were taken in the uh, south part of China. All these houses are of lot, lot, built of flowers. Flowers carpet. Focus. We are surprised. You see, this house is made of a combination of stone, wood, and the clay. So is this house, and brick. And these are Chinese lanterns for the New Year, I suppose. Yeah. But something was wrong with the projector, I suppose. The whole town, you see, this picture is taken from a very high point, you find, see, the first view of the town. All the houses are made of flowers. Watch the different forms of gables here. And there are man, uh, many lakes and rivers in the world China. And the following uh, are some slides showing the rural house by the water. You see, this is a the mountains beyond are snow clad. But down uh, uh, before these houses, there are flowers. You see the flowers? I think the red is in the picture has much, much color to the <laughs> This is also how to steer And now, uh, as I have said before, although the Chinese architecture heritage is very rich and very diversified in rural China, rural China and also, although a building boom has just started in rural China, the picture of rural housing in China it's not at all rosy, it's not at rosy, and not without any problem. And uh, first among the problems is that since the beginning of the building boom in rural China, many land has been occupied and used for building instead of farming. And although China has a very vast, vast territory, but every that is land for farm for farming occupies only 30 percent of the total land area of China, and the acre land per capita per peasants is less than one seventh of a hectare, which is much lower than the world's average. Oh, But these problems, but once this problem arises and the Chinese government has taken measures just in time to stop it, 
No SE for SE road, only hillside, hilly side, and land not good enough for farming can be used for building houses. And the peasants are encouraged to build two story houses instead of bungalows. All these are just for saving land and especially land for farming. Another problem is that the rural building boom starts so sudden that the planning work simply cannot catch up. So houses were built at random and without any general plan at all. And in most cases, without the necessary nodes, drainage, sewage, and all these public facilities and not to say shops and schools. And a few of the rural housing in China do have a general plan, but houses are usually grouped in simple rows, but they look like just like barracks. So in order to solve these problems in rural housing, the Chinese government has taken many measures.